from Ema Maguire. I got hooked on a drug once. It created an altered chemical state in my brain that I haven't recovered from since. It made me do crazy things, but I had no control. I was addicted. My drug, love. As a recovering addict, I now know there are three distinct stages of love. Join me on my journey of madness. We begin at stage one, lust. At puberty, two sex hormones become active in the body, estrogen and testosterone. And from then on in, we are constantly on the prowl for someone to reproduce with. How do we entice them? We flirt. Some of us better than others. <laughs> Flirting ignites an animalistic part of the human brain, giving us two choices, approach or retreat. That hottie in the front row, approach. The guy you think you recognize from Crime Watch, retreat. Now, I've used all my best moves and you were desperate enough to fall for them. Come with me to stage two, romantic attraction. People associate love with the heart, but the real magic happens in the brain. Using a big scanner, scientists were able to see the parts of the brain that light up when people are madly in love. And I happen to have the results right here. <laughs> the first area is the caudate nucleus. It helps us <laughs> expect <laughs> and detect rewards. In this case, love. The second area is the ventral tegmental area. <laughs> This is a chemical making factory, our own personal cupid shooting arrows laced with love drugs into our vulnerable brain. These love drugs are serotonin blockers, dopamine and adrenaline. And this chemical cocktail gives us a natural high, stimulating the same area of the brain as cocaine with similar side effects. Loss of sleep and appetite, increased heart rate, obsessive thoughts and ultimately addiction. Put simply, we are chemically insane. However, our brain cannot survive in this state forever. It sobers up, guiding us to stage three, attachment. We are now in this for the long haul. Our brain responds with a rush of oxytocin, the love hormone. It is the glue in a long-term relationship, keeping us together long enough to raise a family. Now, I suspect many of you here will become victim to this drug called love. So, next time you're caught doing something crazy, like planning your entire life around casually bumping into your crush, don't blame yourself, blame science. Thank you. There's been a lot to love tonight, and more the merrier, the final finalist, the final set of questions. So, what, how can we learn all this stuff about love? What, what can we do? What, what, what do you do now? What, how do you approach this? <laughs> what are you doing later? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Depending like, on how does tonight it change, goes. Does it change your approach to life? Well, you'd think it would take all the romance out of it, but it just gives you a better understanding. Um, and now whenever you see people who have recently fallen in love and they're acting crazy and they're obsessed with them and they won't stop talking about them, you kind of think, before you would have been like, I wish he would shut up, but now you're a bit like, he can't help it, he's insane, do you know, so. <laughs> but, but no, I mean more about you, I mean like, if you, if you, you know, when you're in a relationship, do you kind of go, oh, there's all just chemicals, or do, I mean, or well, can This is you... getting very personal, but um, <laughs> I do know before... I can bring out a psychiatrist's chair, if you like, <laughs> if you can... Before you do think just, you know, why is this happening? But now that I have more of an understanding, if I was to do something that was, say, crazy, I would now think, oh, you know, it's not my fault. Or, you know, <laughs> if I really liked someone, and I was doing, I would try, I would say to them, do you know, this isn't me, this is just my brain. So it helps you kind of understand, um, and it, under, it helps you understand how to control these things as well. So it has been very helpful. But isn't love supposed to be blind as well? Don't you forget all this stuff at the height of passion as well? So however much you've, you've researched it, it doesn't yeah, really help. Yeah, it is, it is supposed to be blind. Everyone is supposed to have, a, you know, a love map of their ideal person growing up. But then they'll see someone and they won't really match it. And they'll kind of um, look over things that they don't like. So they might say, you know, well, he, he, he might not be the best looking, but I think he's really attractive, or 
he might only have one tooth, but I think he's really hot, you know, so. <laughs> and is there science behind that? There is science behind that. It's more the psychology of you being able to overlook someone, someone's, you know, less attractive features, because you're thinking the amount of genetic material that they have <laughs> <laughs> that is good outweighs the bad. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank have you. they found the hormone for the sort of simmering resentment after 20 years of marriage? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not so much a hormone, but this is actually a scientific case. Um, there are people, do you know I was talking about the three stages? There are people who after say 20 years, not naming any names, but they start to feel, I kind of miss the rush I had in stage two. And people will go back, this is, this is why people cheat, um, people will actually go back to stage two because they want the rush of hormones, they want that cocaine-like addiction again. They don't like the boredom that's associated with attachment. But resentment might be just an issue you have to work on. <laughs> <laughs> to, to that end, actually, because um, it's funny, this is something I talk a lot about at, at festivals and things, and many people are now starting to ask me about the kind of biological basis of the seven-year itch. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on that? Well, when I was researching this, I was looking up seven-year itch. It was one of the things I was interested in. But it turns out it's supposed to evolutionary-wise and biologically-wise, be more of a four-year itch. Um, because when I said, you know, people are stuck together through the love hormone long enough to raise a family, in evolution, our ancestors, they needed to hang around long enough to raise a child through infancy, you know, when they're really needy and wake up until they're about four, and then they could move on and have another child with whoever they wanted. But now that we are more likely to stick in the one family, it's, I think it's seven year itch now to allow you to raise, you know, your 2.4 kids or whatever it is. Um, but it's biologically, I think it's supposed to be more a four year itch. So four years of hormones and then three years of blind optimism. That's kind of <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Such cynicism for scratching off three year itch or three minute itch. Show your love for Ema Maguire. <laughs>